Chapter 1 Lairds Ourselves Mark my words, John will make more than an ordinary man. Helen MacDonald's judgment on her eldest son. Where John A. MacDonald was born and when he was born are unknown, or rather are not known exactly. About the essentials of his beginnings there are no doubts whatever. He was born in the Scottish industrial city of Glasgow in 1815. There were historical dimensions to both place and date. Glasgow was the lustiest child of Britain's Industrial Revolution, a sleepy town of only 20,000 in 1791, its shipyards along the Clyde, its engineering works and factories, and its dark satanic mills had sent the town's population soaring above 100,000 by the time of MacDonald's birth, less than a quarter century later. As well, 1815 was the year of the Battle of Waterloo. That cataclysmic military clash didn't so much ensure Napoleon's defeat, which was inevitable eventually anyway, as ensure that Britain, its strength multiplied by its long industrial lead over all its rivals, would become the global powerhouse of the 19th century. By pure happenstance, Britain's global reach created a possibility that its leftover colonies in North America strung across the top half of the continent like widely spaced and oddly sized beads and having little in common other than their mutual Britishness for the most part might yet just remain independent from their overwhelming neighbor, the coming hegemon of the 20th century. For that to actually happen, however, required the arrival of a leader who could cajole and bluff and bully these colonies into becoming a whole larger than the sum of their parts. In 1815, little of this was on the slightest interest to anyone in the British Isles. Yet it was in Glasgow in that year that Canada's future began to take shape. The minutia of MacDonald's birth need to be cleared up. Throughout his life, for the near century and a quarter that has followed his death, his birthplace has been commemorated as January 11, 1815, as in the joyous celebratory dinner staged each year in Kingston, Ontario, for example, and in the inscription on all the plaques and statues that honor him. But this particular day may be a mistake. The January 11th date is taken from the entry for his birth made by his father, Hugh MacDonald, and his memorandum book. The entry recorded in the General Register Office in Edinburgh, though, is January 10th. Similarly, precision about where Specifically, MacDonald was born, while a matter of lesser consequence is as difficult to determine. The delivery may have taken place at 29 Ingram Street in Glasgow, or not far away at 18 Brunswick Street, both on the south side of the Clyde River, because the family moved between these locations around the time of his birth. Footnote. Hugh MacDonald recorded the birth dates of all his children in the 1820 edition of his memorandum book. End of footnote. To pick at a last unknowable knit, MacDonald's father recorded the moment of birth as 4.15, without specifying afternoon or early morning. The other defining attributes of MacDonald's birth are known beyond argument. His parents were middle class, if precariously so. They were Scots, and so of course was he. And soon after his birth, they chose to immigrate to Canada rather than take the advice of Samuel Johnson about the most attractive prospect that the Scotsman could ever come upon and follow the usual road to London. 
Immigration always happens for one of two reasons or of both simultaneously. Either individuals or families are pushed out from their homeland by poverty, oppression, failure, or plain bad luck, or they are pulled towards a new country by the tantalizing promise it holds for new beginnings and new opportunities. Both factors applied to McDonald's, but in distinctive ways. When they set out across the Atlantic in 1820, John A. himself was then five years old. An early biographer described him as having a bright eye, a lively manner, and a head of curly brown hair, which darkened into black as he grew up. At least supposedly, he showed early promise of having the gift of the gab. Once given a speech to a gathering of relatives by mounting a table, from which, as his gestures became more ever dramatic, he projected himself to the ground. As soon as the Napoleonic Wars ended, England was gripped by a depression that cut most deeply into its farming countries. The same outwards push existed in Scotland, given force there by the clearances of people from the land to make way for sheep, as often, despite later myth, by Scottish landowners as by English ones. The great migration from the British Isles to both Canada and the United States dates from this period, although it remained relatively small until the 1830s, later multiplying exponentially through the 1840s as the Irish fled from the horrors of their great famine. To magnify the force of the outwards push, the British governments of the day accepted the thesis of Thomas Malthus that population growth would always outpace the growth in food production. To avoid social unrest, perhaps even the ultimate horror of a revolution of the kind from which Napoleon had sprung, successive governments encouraged the idle poor to move elsewhere. The Macdonalds though, were not a family of farmers, and although hard up, they weren't poor, not in the sense of their being malnourished and in rags. The force that pushed them out was failure, quite unnecessary failure, and the product almost entirely of the fecklessness of MacDonald's father, Hugh. Before Hugh MacDonald is introduced, it is necessary to go backwards one further genealogical step to Hugh's own father, John MacDonald. Although he never left Scotland, John MacDonald set the family on its transatlantic journey. When he came down from the highlands, pushed out by the clearances implemented by his laird, the Duke of Sutherland, he went first to a little village in the Strathfleet Valley, and then on to the southern Lanshire town of Dornoch, where he set up as a shopkeeper. John MacDonald was widely liked. A contemporary described him as having a tender nature, full of humor, a quick and winning manner, with a bow and smile for a bow and smile for everyone he met. Many of those qualities would pass to his grandson, as did his longevity, for he died at the age of 86. John MacDonald's most distinctive legacy to his grandson was his head of abundant but curiously crinkly hair. His most important legacy to his heirs, though, was to get them out of the beautiful but bleak highlands into a settled community, and to raise them there to at least the lower rungs of the middle class. Hugh MacDonald squandered the greater part of what had been handed down to him. Born in Dornoch, he moved in early adulthood to the growing city of Glasgow, and there owned and operated a succession of small enterprises, one, for instance, making bandanas, their common characteristic was that they all failed. Hugh was known as a decent, amiable man, good in conversation and impossible to dislike. This quality served him well after one bankruptcy when he was at serious risk of being sent to a debtor's prison. 
he was allowed not only to remain free, but to keep his liberty and household effects, later selling them to pay for the tickets for his transatlantic passage. Two attributes that Hugh passed on to his sons were that he had a hot Celtic temper, and that he drank a lot. Hugh MacDonald's most considerable accomplishment during his relatively short life was to marry Helen Shaw. It happened in 1811 when she was at the relatively advanced age of 34, and he at the comparatively tender one of 28. Helen was an exceptional woman. The rock upon which the small tribe took its stand, facing outwards to the world, arms linked. She kept the family going through thin and thick. A surviving portrait of her, done at least middle age, depicts accurately her rock-like qualities of strength and determination. She was a little above the medium height, large limbed, and capable of much endurance commented the contemporary biographer E. B. Begar. Footnote. E. B. Biggar's Anecdotal Life of Sir John MacDonald, hurried into print in 1891, the year of his death, is the source of most of the best-known anecdotes about him. The first biography of MacDonald, The Life and Times of the Right Honorable Sir John A. MacDonald, published as early as 1883, was written by J. E. Collins. An exapriate sorry uh, <laughs> no um do, 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 do. The Life and Times of the Right Honorable Sir John A. MacDonald, published as early as 1883, was written by J. E. Collins, an expatriate Newfoundlander. By a curious coincidence, Collins also wrote the first biography of Louis Royal, as well as a Bodice ripper of a novel, Annette the Métis Spy, a heroine of the N.W. Rebellion. He died in New York of drink in 1892. End of footnote. Um, another footnote here on Dornoch. Uh, small town, then and now, Dornoch has one claim to fame as the site of the last judicial execution for witchcraft in Britain in 1727. A court ruled that a Janet Horn had turned her daughter into a pony Hmm, right. And a footnote. Uh, her features were large, and as some considered coarse, but there beamed through her dark eyes a depth of apprehension mingled with such graciousness and goodwill. And we are referring to, I believe there, Helen Shaw. She read widely, and as big our row, had she possessed the advantages of a high education and the opportunities some get in life, she would have been a noted woman. While the portrait of Helen MacDonald suggests the depth and liveliness, while the portrait of Helen MacDonald suggests the depth and liveliness of her eyes, it betrays little hint of the most attractive of her qualities her capacity for gaiety. She and John A. loved to trade stories and jokes, his being the racier. Beggar com commented, she appreciated a droll saying or a droll situation. Once when MacDonald ascended to the social height of being elected president of Kingston's St. Andrew's Society, he led a gathering preceded by a piper to her house. When she heard the wail of the bagpipe, Helen came downstairs and danced a jig in the street. She was wholly Scots, and above all a Highlander. Her preferred language was Gaelic. Her father fought for Bonnie Prince, Charlie at Culloden and afterwards. <laughs>
as did many Scots, joined the British Army. She could not be stonily stubborn. Sorry. <laughs> she could be stonily stubborn, a quality that repeated taxed MacDonald's talents once he became the de facto head of the family. She possessed an exceptional memory, a gift she passed on to her son, and functioned as the family historian and the teller of Highland tales. Did you know New Scotland represented the Real Highlanders? <laughs> Just, uh, no, whatever, argue amongst yourself. Anyway, uh, of her children, two boys and two girls, at the time of leaving Glasgow, there was never any doubt that her favorite was her elder son, John Alexander. Mark my words, John will make more than an ordinary man, she said on many occasions. Besides the push-up failure at home, there were more positive attractions pulling the MacDonald family to Canada. Of these, the most apparent was, the Hugh, was that Hugh MacDonald, unlike the great majority of immigrants, uh, footnote, immigrants were then commonly referred to as emigrants, with an E, because the significant point was that they were leaving Britain rather than that they were coming to Canada. End of footnote. Possess the priceless assets of connections. In and around Kingston, the town where they were headed, there was a cluster of MacDonald relatives and cousins. That most were distant relatives mattered not the least. They all belonged to the same clan. The most important person, by far, was Colonel Donald McPherson, who was married to Helen MacDonald's stepsister. The Colonel, who twice fought for king and country against the Americans during the War of Independence and the War of 1812, retired afterwards to the garrison town of Kingston, built a large stone house called Clooney, meaning meadow, meaning meadow and settled down as one of the community's principal citizens. Before leaving Glasgow, Hugh MacDonald knew that Col Colonel MacPherson would find space in his house for him and his family for at least a transition time, and that afterwards MacPherson would help with advice and contacts as Hugh set up his first business. How much Hugh MacDonald knew about Canada before he left is unknowable. Information was available, however, in booklets such as The Emigrant's Guide to the British Settlements in Upper Canada and the United States of America, published the same year that the MacDonalds left. In some ways, Canada was distinctly unappealing. Its total population was only a little more than half a million, the great majority being French-speaking Canadians, the particular part of Canada where they were headed Upper Canada, now Ontario, had fewer than 200,000 people. Mostly the land was untouched, primeval forest broken here and there by the crude log shacks of pioneer settlers. All of Canada was incomparably poorer and less developed than any of the 13 American colonies. Yet Canada possessed two considerable attractions. Land itself was free to most settlers. To the MacDonalds, this bounty was irrelevant, since they were headed for a town and not for a clearing in the wilderness. The country's second general attraction, that there were no class divisions, was a derivative from the first and exactly fitted the ambitions, however muddled, of Hugh MacDonald. As the Scottish settler George Forbes wrote to his brother back in Aberdeenshire, we in Canada have this glorious privilege that the ground we tread is our own and our children's after us. And he went on to describe the fundamental difference between Canada and any part of Britain, or indeed anywhere in Europe. Here we are 
lards ourselves. Had John A.'s parents moved from Glasgow to somewhere else in the British Isles, the upwards drive that MacDonald eventually undertook would have butted sooner or later against the steel ceiling of the British class system. In Canada, by contrast, there was no aristocracy at all other than a few fragments within the family compact. The small clique who, as politicians, public officials, and judges, ran the country on behalf of the Governor-General. Lower Canada, or Quebec, was markedly more hierarchical. Instead, the vast majority of Canadians were either middle class or believed that they could become middle class, or, since the term middle class wasn't yet used, they were respectable citizens, law-abiding, church-going, debt-free, or attempting diligently to be all three. The idea of classlessness was lodged deep in the Canadian consciousness from its very beginnings. In Roughing It in the Bush, Susanna Moody noted crossly of her servants, they no sooner set foot upon Canadian shores than all respect for their employers, all subordination is at an end. She went on to record though that, with all their insolent airs of independence, I must confess that I prefer the Canadian to the European servant. In fact, a respectable claim can be made that in one vital respect the country MacDonald's parents were taking him to was more democratic, democratic even than the United States, that great experiment in egalitarianism, in the South, and in its parts of New England, there was an aristocracy, and in the North a class of self-made millionaires who cascaded their wealth upon their heirs. Above the border, there was virtually no overclass, but no underclass either. There were no slaves in Canada, they having been liberated by Governor John Graves Simcoe's decree of 1793 and there was no equivalent of the proletariat now developing rapidly in the great northern cities of the United States. Almost all Canadians were indeed lairds in possibility and in self-perception, if not in actual fact. They could rise as high as their talent, ambition, and luck might take them. It's unknowable whether Hugh and Helen MacDonald had any idea of the benefit they were conferring on their elder son by bringing him to a society where, compared with almost any other society in the world, there were fewer barriers to whatever upwards rise he might attempt. But that's what they did by not taking the well-traveled road down to London and instead taking a ship to a faraway country in which there were just about <laughs> no roads at all. Chapter 2 A Boy's Town Remember, oh remember the fascination of the turkey. John A. MacDonald to a girl he owed a dance. When the MacDonalds came up the St. Lawrence River from the Gulf in 1820, they would have seen the same strangely foreign prospect, at first impressive but after a while depressing, that Catherine Parr Trail described in the backwoods of Canada a few years later. I begin to grow weary of its immensity. We see nothing more than long lines of pine-clad hills with here and there white specks that they tell me are settlements. At long last, there was a real town, Quebec City. There, their ship, the small 600-ton Earl of Buckingham, discharged its 600 passengers, the McDonald's included. Behind them, at last, were six weeks of the appalling food, overcrowding, incessant lice, and rats, and complete lack of privacy that everyone in steerage experienced. 
along with the constant damp and seasickness that even those in cabin class endured. Footnote. To minimize the cost of feeding their passengers, some captains were known to supply them on the first day with large helpings of porridge and molasses, making them so sick that thereafter they seldom demanded their full rations. End of footnote. They must have been delighted to see the end of this decaying vessel. Indeed, two years later, it drifted into Galway Bay and broke up in pieces. Left on the dock at Quebec City was the small tribe of MacDonalds, as well as their orphan cousin, Maria Clark, who had accompanied them on the voyage. It numbered Hugh and Helen MacDonald, both now in their forties, and their four children, Margaret, the oldest at seven, nicknamed Maul, then John A., and James, one year younger. And lastly, two-year-old Louisa, known as Lou. A fifth child, the firstborn William, had died back in Glasgow. Scots, unlike the English, and even the Irish, to a lesser extent, almost never sent a single family member ahead to scout the terrain, but moved any distance as a complete family. They would have been amazed by the scene that greeted them once they entered the port, endless lines of log rafts with a crude shack at their center, stretching out for miles along the river and waiting to load the pontoons of huge squared timbers they had brought all the way from the Ottawa Valley onto one of the same sailing ships that had just transported the immigrants. Their stop at Quebec City would have been exciting. Lots of familiar red coats and Royal Navy tars, but also the unfamiliar language of most of the local inhabitants. And they would have taken a little time to look over the sights, the massive hulk of the citadel, the steep bank soaring upwards from the St. Lawrence over which Wolfe's Highlanders had scrambled, the imposing churches and nunneries and the low stone houses packed together along narrow streets as in some Breton town. By now the MacDonalds had completed barely half their journey. Beyond Quebec City there were no roads, or none that anyone would risk trying by stagecoach. Canada's entire highway system was made up then of its rivers and lakes. The one great cross-country ship trip undertaken just for show was Governor General Lord Sydenham's amazing 1840 journey from Toronto to Montreal in a sleigh with a bed in it, completed in just 36 hours, a record that stood until the railways came along. Their second boy, those poor animals, I'm <laughs> just thinking, they had to tug that, um, whatever. Um, their second voyage lasted some four weeks, first from Quebec City to Montreal, then on to Kingston. It would have been as comfortable as their ocean crossing. They made their way first in a bateau and then in a Durham boat, each open to the elements, moving slowly up the St. Lawrence, sometimes pushed by sail power, sometimes pushed by oxen and by oars, but often both pulled and pushed by the male passengers as they jumped into the chill water to squeeze the boat past shallows and between rocks. Footnote. The real hero of this feat wasn't so much Sydenham as the stagecoach operator in Toronto, York, William Weller, who organized the relays of horses needed to maintain an average speed of 15 miles an hour. For his contributions, Weller received $400 and a gold watch, and the horses were turned into dog food. No, I'm just kidding. I added that. Anyway, um, end of footnote. On August 13, 1820, the family made it to Kingston, in Colonel McPherson's house, packed in with its own family, 
they could at last rest, eat properly, clean their clothes, and most important, begin to learn about their new country. Of all the towns in Upper Canada, where Hugh MacDonald might have gone, Kingston was perhaps the best possible place for an imaginative boy to grow up. With a population of around 4,000 people, it was the biggest center in the colony, even larger than York, to be renamed Toronto in 1834. Above all, it encompassed within its boundaries an uncommonly wide range of human experience. It had a military garrison of red-coated British soldiers, who regularly emerged from Fort Henry to march through the streets to the beat of drums and the peep of pipes. It was a port tied up alongside its finger piers, jutting out from the shore throughout the summer and into the fall, where thirty or forty sailing ships from three masters to four and aft schooners and later steamships belching columns of smoke as they prepared to chug off to York and Montreal, Oswego, and Niagara. To the north, the dense forbidding forest came close to the town's limits. Inside it, almost always hiding out of sight, were Indians. From spring to fall, waves of immigrants arrived in Kingston. After a few weeks' rest and burdened down by provisions, the newcomers would head on either westwards to the softer, richer country beyond the town of York, or by turning right at some point along Lake Ontario, plunge northwards into the forest, or try their luck at some isolated spot as pioneers in the manner of Susanna Moody and Catherine Parr Trail and their unhardy husbands. Kingston itself lacked a rural hinterland because the Precambrian shield came right to the town, but farmers did well in the good soil of Prince Edward County, some 40 miles to the west, and supplied the growing town with food. The Kingston of those days was rude and rowdy and raunchy, rather than scrubbed and neat and dignified as today. It was also exceedingly dangerous. Immigrants often arrived riddled with disease. Touching off a typhoid epidemic in 1828, a cholera epidemic in 1832, a truly terrible typhus epidemic in 1847, during which 1,200 immigrants and townsfolk had to be buried in a mass grave, and yet another cholera outbreak in 1849. Soldiers and sailors brawled with each other and with the locals in incomparably rougher versions of the occasional town-gown confrontations of today. Kingston's one constant has always been its history. Whoever occupied it commanded the entry point to the chain of the Great Lakes, as well as the exit point from the interior, on down the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic. The French built Fort Frontenac as far back as 1673. The Loyalists arrived in 1784 laid out a plan of streets and housing plots, and drew lots of the best of them. The town's importance as a transfer point for cargo and people would soon be enhanced by the construction eastwards of the Lachine Canal to Montreal, and the northwards and northwards of the Rideau Canal, snaking its way up to Bytown, later Ottawa. The starting point was the mouth of the Cataraque River, which formed Kingston's Harbor. Later, a major share of Kingston's historical aura would derive from its association with MacDonald. No other Canadian leader has ever been as intimately connected to any place as he was to Kingston. A boy, when he arrived, he was educated and established himself in business there. He represented the town for the greater part of his political career, winning 13 elections there, and he is buried in its Catarqua Cemetery. Kingston still commemorates him on two occasions each year, the anniversaries of his birth and his death. Above all, 
Kingston provided MacDonald with the raw material for the greatest of his political gifts, his matchless understanding of life as it is actually lived, and of people as they actually live it, with all their faults and follies, interspersed with occasional spasms of altruism and even idealism. Charles Dickens, who came through in 1842, dismissed Kingston as a very poor town. Had he stopped for a while, Dickens would have found it a microcosm of the human condition. Cows and sheep, pigs and chickens ran freely through Kingston's streets, which, when it rained, were deep in mud, dirty and pungent from the leavings of animals and sometimes of humans too. The only means by which a pedestrian could make it from one plank sidewalk to the opposite side of the road without sinking into the gummy, stinking mass was by using the occasional narrow crosswalk of flagstones or cobbles. The Precambrian shield lay just below the surface, so the sewer system was primitive, with shallow and odiferous privy pits. In winter, workers carried the night soil into the ice in the harbor to slide to the bottom once spring arrived. Of course, all these things were standard in British North American towns in the early 19th century. Their one aesthetic advance over today being the absence of any overhead tangle of telephone and hydro wires. Rural Canadians who made up more than four in five of all Canadians, live lives that for a great many were nasty, brutish, short, and bitterly cold. Alexander Tillock Galt, who would work alongside MacDonald in the battle for confederation, provided a first-rate summary of country life in a report to his London bosses in a British land settlement company. A settlement in the backwoods of Canada however romantic and pleasing may be the accounts generally published of it, has nothing but stern reality and hardship connected with it, he wrote. Along in the woods, in his log cabin with his family, tired from his day's work and knowing that the morrow brings but the same toil, the migrant will find but few of his fancies realized, for the first years, the emigrant to succeed must work as hard and suffer perhaps greater privations than had he remained in Great Britain. Unlike today, though, conditions in the towns were, if anything, worse than those in the countryside, except perhaps for women, who suffered terribly from the loneliness of pioneer life. In towns and villages, women at least had companionship and some kind of support networks. But... Townies were much more likely than their country kin to succumb to diseases caused by everything from epidemics to poor or non-existent sanitation. Unlike pioneer settlers, they were self-sufficient neither in food nor in wood for winter fuel. In the towns, a great many jobs ended in early November. The ports closed because of lice. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> The ports closed because of ice, and all public works and construction were halted. At the same time that the price of food and firewood soared, the wages of those still at work in small manufacturing plants, stores and offices, were often cut by a third or even half. As the winter wore on, workers spent as much as a fifth of their miserable wages on wood to keep themselves warm. The cost of bread typically went up by as much as 50%. Commonly, those who had jobs went straight to bed when they returned to their barely heated lodgings. Some practical types even committed crime so that they would be sent to a partially heated jail. The late spring, when food and fuel prices were at their highest, was known as the pinching season. Yet, as historian Judith Fingard has noted, there was a conspicuous absence of mass demonstrations and violent crime amongst the poor during the winters of greatest suffering. The poor were kept quiescent by exhaustion, by the bitter cold, and far from least by a deep and seldom questioned respect for the law. MacDonald learned 
all about this real, unromantic urban Canada while he grew up in Kingston and from his boyhood stays with his roving family in nearby Prince Edward County. He gained an understanding of rural Canada as well. Footnote on Fingard's, Fingard's study. The source is Fingard's study, The Winter's Tale, The Seasonal Contours of Pre-Industrial Poverty in British North America, 1815 to 1860. End of footnote. Kingston was actually better off than other towns in Upper Canada. An 1837 guide for emigrants called it perhaps the finest built town in the province, while T.R. Preston, an English visitor, at around the same time said it resembled an English village, but somewhat stragglingly built, though it possessed in its substantial parts some very substantial homes. Kingston possessed one invaluable urban asset, lots of limestone. When the McDonald's arrived, most houses were constructed of logs or hewn lumber, a motley array of dwellings often destroyed by fire. With the completion of the Rideau Canal, though, a lot of Scottish stonemasons were suddenly looking for work, and by the 1840s, Kingston had begun to acquire more substantial buildings made of the local stone. A few of the leading citizens commissioned remarkable houses in the delicate Adamesque style and began to install beautiful moldings and chimney pieces in their mansions. Some major public buildings, far grander than the small town itself, were constructed during these years. A hospital, a penitentiary, a lunatic asylum, a courthouse, and later a superb town hall. Kingston even became important enough for a stagecoach to make a twice-weekly trip between it and Montreal. A bone-shattering experience for sure, but with the benefit that, unlike in England, highwaymen were rare. The Kingston of Macdonald's Day even encompassed some of the finer things of life. It had a lending library and two newspapers. Occasionally, traveling theater groups performed for a night or two, and in the churches there were organ recitals, and on Sundays, sonorous, scary sermons. Band concerts were particularly popular, and for the active, so were cricket matches, fox hunts, and horse races all made possible by the military garrison stationed in the town. The military, moreover, made one major cultural breakthrough. On the frozen lake, members of the Royal Canadian Rifles developed, by hit and miss and bump and grind, a new game using skates, field hockey sticks, and a lacrosse ball. Footnote. In the absence of any zoning regulations, grand houses, shacks, stores, and grog shops all jostled against one another. End of footnote. The most intense competition in Kingston revolved around the sexes, as Deccans would have noted had he lingered. The highest ambition of the wives of successful merchants and farmers was to marry off a daughter to a bachelor English officer. Few fulfilled this aspiration, because in the cruel comment of one witness, they all still smelt of bread and butter. Nevertheless, the young officers praised the way Kingston chaperones were less watchful than those back in England. What's wrong with the smell of bread and butter, baby? Anyway, <laughs> the underside of life flourished here too. One visitor described the streets as swarming with drunkards and prostitutes, the inevitable consequence of so many soldiers and sailors and immigrants passing through. Kingston's Common Council, or Town Council, reported in 1841 that there was a drink shop for every seven or eight men, ranging from ranging from taverns or pubs to low dram shops or shibines. In counterpoint, 
a local temperance society was started up. It suggested, among other things, the installation of a treadmill as the best way to deal with drunkenness and better the morals of the lower classes. Interesting idea. If Kingston was in many ways a brutal society, so at the time was all of British North America, and indeed just about the entire world. Drunken soldiers and sailors were easy marks for muggers. Soldiers often deserted across the nearby American border. Those caught were flogged at a triangular wooden frame to the beat of a drum. Punishments everywhere were brutal. Inmates in the penitentiary in Kingston included a child of eight who began his three-year sentence with a flogging by the cat. What? Do they mean cat tails? Cat and nine tails? Or? Whatever. Uh, another inmate, 10 years old, received 120 strokes of rawhide. Hangings were a public attraction. One steamer brought in 200 tourists, including children, to watch an execution. A man was hanged for stealing a cow. After three months of living jammed up in the McPherson home, Hugh MacDonald moved his family out on its own. He opened a store in the center of town, and the six of them lived in the rooms above. Beside a mix of foodstuffs and hardware, he offered customers groceries, wines, brandy, shrub, a cordial, vinegar, powder, and shot, English window glass, and putty, etc. The enterprise failed quickly. Hugh opened another general store in a, another location. It soon failed, too. Amid these setbacks, the family had to come to terms with an almost unimaginable trauma. The second son, James, was killed at the age of five and a half by a family servant named Kennedy. It's impossible to be certain what happened. One day, Hugh and Helen went out, leaving John A. and James at home in Kennedy's care. The servant was a secret drinker. In one account, Kennedy got angry with James for crying for his parents and lashed out at him with a stick. In another, he lunged drunkenly at him and James slipped, hitting his head on an andoron. Whatever the cause, whatever the cause, the young boy died while seven-year-old John A. witnessed his murder or manslaughter. The May 3rd issue of the Kingston Chronicle in 1822 carried this sad obituary. On Monday, the 22nd, Alt, James, second son of Mr. Hugh MacDonald, merchant of this town, aged five years and six months. The newspaper notice was the family's entire recorded response. No charge was ever brought against Kennedy. Hugh entered no record of his death in his memorandum book of family events, though John A. later added it to the chronology. That's interesting. I'd like to know more about him. The servant. No burial place for the boy has ever been identified. He is not listed among those interred in the family plot at Cartacque Cemetery. Nor is there any reference to the tragedy in any of the family letters that have been preserved. And just incidentally, that uh, name is spelled C-A-T-A-R-A-Q-U-I. Kataraqui. Kataraqui. How about that? At the time, the most common reference likely to be mentioned in family correspondence would have been to a locket or brooch containing a circle of the lost child's hair, commonly worn for years afterwards by a bereaved mother. Yet no surviving letter contains any mention of such a commemorative object. This silent reaction can be attributed for... 
This silent reaction can be attributed far more readily to acceptance than to callousness. Then, death was part of life, and as any stroll the, through any old cemetery will confirm, to be young then was to be close to death. A survey done in Montreal in 1867 found that two out of every five children never reached the age of five. As well, grief may have been generally subdued because it amounted to an expression of doubt about the existence of an afterlife. Religion provided healing. A loved one who had died was often referred to as one who went before. To a place where the others would later join the departed. The single certain consequence of this tragedy was that, henceforth, the MacDonald's family entire hopes rested on the shoulders of John Alexander, the last surviving male heir among the original three. Footnote. This plot was purchased by John A. MacDonald in 1850. The remains of Hugh MacDonald, who had been buried in the old lower burial ground, were brought there but not, apparently, the remains of James MacDonald. End of footnote. After his second enterprise in Kingston had failed, Hugh decided to change his location entirely. In 1824, four years after their arrival, he moved the family out to Hay Bay, on the lake shore to the west of Kingston, where he opened yet another store. Young John, by now nine years old, continued with his schooling in the nearby village of Adolphastown. Adolphastown. Hmm. Each day, he walked three miles to school, and in the late afternoon, three miles back. This commute was entirely ordinary. His sisters, Margaret and Louisa, made the same walk with him. The three of them played well together often as soldiers in a game where he was always the officer, and they got into the usual scrapes. As the only boy now, and anyway, his mother's favorite, John was spoiled rotten. Margaret, small and delicate, possessed an aptitude for seeming vulnerable. Louisa, by contrast, was tall with a stern face and a long, thick nose. At best, she could be called plain, in later years, she protested that someone had compared her to her brother, the ugliest man in Canada. Independent and stubborn like her mother, she was John A.'s pal. One of the most surprising comments MacDonald ever made was to his confidential secretary and biographer, Joseph Pope. I never had a boyhood. From fifteen I began to earn my living. It is MacDonald's rare lapse into unguarded bitterness that makes this admission so surprising. More astounding still, his complaint was quite untrue. MacDonald did indeed have to quit school at the age of 15 when he began his legal career, but this pattern was almost universal then. The phenomenon of adolescence had yet to be discovered or invented. A survey done in 1871 found that one in four boys aged 11 to 15 were working in some kind of job. Typically for the times, Egerton Ryerson, the great Canadian educator, espoused the proposition that children were small men in need of greater instruction than older siblings. In any case, MacDonald's boyhood was more agreeable than that of most boys. At home, he experienced no shortage of love and he benefited from the kindliness of an extended family. While the family was pinched for money, that was not in the least unusual, and of little concern to a boy. The explanation for MacDonald's bitterness may reside in another comment he made to Pope. If I had a university education, he reflected, I should probably have entered the path of literature and acquired distinction therein. Looking back from a time near the end of his life, MacDonald may have been expressing an uneasy sense that politics hadn't stretched his intellect enough, and that he had missed out on opportunities to express the creative and imaginative side of his character. Perhaps he was 
thinking enviously of British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, his ideological and physical look-alike, who, amid the grinding pressures of politics, had found time to write no fewer than twenty novels, Tancred and Endymion the best received among them. While at school, the length of his tenure there being entirely average, MacDonald received an education that was well above the norm. Oh, footnote. In 1830, there were only two universities in British North America, Dalhousie aye, and McGill. Hey, sending MacDonald to either of them would have been quite beyond the family's financial capacity. End of footnote. Second footnote. MacDonald, who closely followed news from Britain, would also have been aware that Disraeli eventually commanded advances of an amazing £10,000 more even than Dickens or Trollope, a reflection naturally more of his appeal as a celebrity than of his skill as a novelist. End of footnote. While at school, the length of his tenure there being entirely average, MacDonald received an education that was well above the norm. The schools he attended, first in Kingston and then in Adolphustown, were the typical one-room schools where children of all ages sat at a raised board that ran around three sides of the room and served as their desk. They faced the fourth, open side, where the teacher had a smaller desk. The only other pieces of furniture were a pail of water and a stove. Most teachers in the region were Scots, each known as a dominie, an apt phrase because of the strap they always carried. Books and paper were rare. For most children, this schooling was their entire education. In Ontario, school was not compulsory until 1874, and then for a minimum of only four months a year a rule that was regularly ignored by farmers' sons. MacDonald mostly had a grand time at school. Boys liked him because he could tell stories and new tricks, and because he wasn't afraid of the masters. They also had a wary respect for his Scottish temper. Girls liked him, even though they teased him as Ugly John, as he most certainly was, with his absurdly crinkly hair and outsized nose but they would have noted with approval, certainly with interest, that he was a bit of a dandy, with a taste in gaudy waistcoats. Wit more than compensated for his lack of looks. At one dance, MacDonald forgot he was due to partner a particular girl in a quadrille. She rejected his abject apologies until he flung himself at her feet, proclaiming maniacally, Remember, oh, remember the fascination of the turkey, with her uncontrollable laughter, came forgiveness. He did all the customary boyish things, getting into scrapes, and at the age of thirteen writing florid poetry to a pretty cousin. Although he seldom took part in sports, he was good at running barefoot, at skating, and at dancing. Early on, he showed some skill in mathematics, an unusual accuracy in spelling and in insatiable appetite for reading. Two factors pushed MacDonald onto a, a life's arc different from that of most of his fellow students. He was a Scot, and he had a mother who was determined that he would be more than an ordinary man. After a couple of years of making the long daily walk to the school in Adolphustown, John was sent by his parents to Kingston to attend the Midland District Grammar School. It was run by a graduate of Oxford University, the Reverend John Wilson. Annual tuition fees were 70 pounds, representing a steep sacrifice for the family. Here, MacDonald learned Latin and French as well as English and mathematics. His French grammar book, dated May 28, 1825, still survives. He stayed with the Macphersons, where he was thoroughly petted and spoiled. Years later, 
His nephew, John Pennington McPherson, recalled a slight biography of his famous relative, how MacDonald would read compulsively, quite untroubled by the noisy antics and quarrels of the large family around him. In the summers, he went back to the Bay of Quinte area, to Glenora, where his father had moved to run a grist mill. It, again, soon failed. Footnote. The stone mill, little changed, still stands in Glenora, Prince Edward County. End of footnote. In 1829, the 14-year-old MacDonald moved to a new establishment for general and classical education, run by a recent newcomer, the Reverend John Cruikshank. There were some 20 pupils from 6 to 16 years old. Among them was Oliver Mowat, later a father of Confederation, along with MacDonald and later still Premier of Ontario. The school's standards were high, the local Scots having decided that the Midland District School was inadequate to give their children a quick start in life. What really set this grammar school apart was that it was co-educational, one of the first in Upper Canada. At the risk of reading too much into it, MacDonald's co-educational experience, reinforced by the female-centered household he grew up in, may explain one of the qualities that set him apart from most men of his day, and of a good many still. In the company of women, MacDonald was always wholly at his ease. He was never awkward or shy or predatory with them. He could flirt and play the gallant, but he never patronized women. As is common enough, MacDonald was his own principal teacher. He read omnivorously history, biographies, politics, poetry, geography. His most remarked upon scholastic skill was his handwriting, clear, large, even, and fluid. His letters would be a delight to later scholars. Cruikshank was always proud to show MacDonald's compositions to new students, and he kept them for years afterwards as models of penmanship. MacDonald's preparation for life ended in his fifteenth year. From then on, he began to live it, but he'd already learned a great deal about life's essence, the ways and the whys of how people behave. <laughs>